Hello and welcome to the Law and Guidance podcast. Again, one of the small, small positives of COVID is that um, lots of great people, great guests are a bit stuck, so can't be doing uh, and uh, going off anywhere. Uh, and uh, today I've got a guest, uh, Jolian Moore. Oh, in fact, I'll get him to introduce himself. Who are you, Joe? Well, the best way of introducing myself is to talk about the event of last summer in which I ticked off an item on my bucket list. And that item was getting into Pest magazine, the magazine of the pest control industry, in consequence of litigation that we brought against government's decision to award £350 million of contracts, PPE contracts, to a small um, pest control specialist called Pestfix. Um, less flippantly, um, I am a QC. Um, I did have an enormously lucrative tax practice. Um, I blew it all up writing about tax avoidance. Um, in the process, became an advisor to the Labour Party on tax policy, uh, and then built a sort of platform on social media, which enabled me to bring public interest litigation, which public interest litigation sort of morphed into a full-time job as director of Good Law Project, uh, which I now run. Fantastic. Well, what a great, great, it's better the introduction I was going to give, um, actually. Um, you're also a professor you would have had of Law School. Sally. <laughs> Um, but you are also a professor at, at um, Durham Law School, um, which is important for sort of our, our younger listeners. But I, I wanted to ask you, Joe, firstly, what um, kind of inspired you to get into law? And then I'd, ask, I'd like to ask you about the Good Law Project uh, and the brilliant um, kind of challenges it's bringing, really. Um. It was a fairly typical journey, actually. Um, it was born most of a lack of imagination. Um, so I had a slightly odd um, segue from school to university. I'd been doing secondary school. Um, I'd got my New Zealand bronze medallion life-saving certificate. Um, when I finished school in New Zealand, I came over to England for a year. Um, that was in May 1989. I got a clerical job at the BBC. And one of the advantages or disadvantages, depending on how you look at these things about being a New Zealander, is that you don't really know what your limitations are. No one has told you, like they're very good at telling you in England. And I um, offered a program on New Zealand poetry to Radio 3 and a play to Radio 4, um, both of which were accepted um, and that meant that despite my very mediocre uh, academic grades, my, my bronze medallions I quipped, um, I was able to get a place at Durham and initially the place uh, at Durham was to do politics and philosophy but I then saw um, some hack legal drama um, on telly one afternoon and I thought to myself this looks like much more fun than philosophy and politics and so I called Durham Law School and the admissions tutor there uh, the long-suffering um, Francis Pritchard um, said well if you want to switch from politics to philosophy um, we'll need to interview you so I sort of hopped on the National Express up to Durham and when I got to Durham, I realized actually this was gonna be a disaster because I hadn't actually done any research into what being a lawyer was gonna look like. And so I tried to can the interview. I was just, I just knew it was gonna be a catastrophe. Um, and so I tried to cancel and Francis had my number and he said, um, Julian, you're in Durham, aren't you? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Pritchard. Um, you should come for the interview anyway, as you are in Durham. Uh, yes, Dr. Pritchard. So with sort of long face, um, I tootled up. And his first um, uh, observation was, um, Julian, if you want to study law, that's fine with us. Um, have you got any questions? <laughs> so I became a lawyer, really, um, despite myself, rather than in consequence of any long, brilliantly executed um, strategy. <laughs> Well, I, I really rather like that because I'm going to ask you at the end about advice to uh, entrance into the law. 
uh, presently and aspiring aspiring lawyers, anything you want to uh, tell them. So bear that in mind uh, with where I'm going. Um, so, Joe, looking at the work you're doing presently with the Good Law Project, it, it's really is really impressive and it's challenging and holding account, if, that, if that's a way to describe it, the government and what the government is doing or, or how it operates uh, and so on. But, but I, I really want to ask you how that came about, really, the Good Law Project, because interestingly, it's a lot of non-lawyers who are always texting me. You know, if you're on Channel 4 News, people text me and say, do you know this guy? It's great what he's doing, uh, whatever. Then I think, well, actually, I'm not at home. You know, I'm usually out and about or whatever. I can't watch it in life. So how did that come about? And really, should you be in politics as opposed to running the Good Law Project um, uh, as a question? Yeah, well... Um, I, uh, as I've said, became an advisor to the Labour Party. Yes. Um, and in 2015, when Labour thought it had locked up the general election, I was in deep discussions about what post in number 10 I was going to hold in the new government. Um, and then, um, to everyone's surprise, uh, everyone in the Labour Party's surprise at any rate, um, Ed Miliband lost the election, um, which was quite a shock. Um, I do remember going to Brixton Village with my wife um, on the Sunday and having a drink or two in the evening to try and cheer myself up the election having been on the Thursday. And um, after a couple of pints, I sort of had cheered up a little and I said to my wife, my love, I said, the, 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 the good ship warm will rise again. Uh, and she looked back at me and said, Jolene, you do know you were never actually Attorney General, don't you? <laughs> um, so um, I, I was sort of slightly at a loose end. I'd already begun to, um, well, I wasn't really burning bridges with clients, but I'd already crossed the Rubicon into um, the public policy sphere from having a pure legal practice. And I was pretty sure I didn't want to go back. So um, I began to, I mean, I continued writing about tax policy. And in fact, I've never had the influence since that I had then. I remember blogging about um, Facebook's accounts yeah. and getting a call. This was um, in the... Uh, well, it was 2015, I suppose it must have been. Um, face, this is when Margaret Hodge was making lots of noise in the Public Accounts Committee about um, tax avoidance. And I got a call immediately. I put my blog up from the world at BBC World at One. Will you come in and talk to us about Facebook's accounts? And then in the cab on the way to the BBC studios, I got a call from Facebook saying, um, we think your blog means X and the Labour Party thinks it means Y. Will you change it so that it's clear that it means X? And I got off that call and I got a call from the Labour Party saying, Facebook thinks your blog means X and we think it means Y. Will you change it so it's clear it means Y? And, I th and then I got to the studio and I did my interview. I thought, my God, this is, this is such power. Um, <laughs> then um, Brexit. Yes. And I was quite... Um, I mean, I was shocked and not shocked. I had watched the TV debates and I had seen the energy and excitement yes. around the leave case that Remain never generated. And so um, I was not um, surprised by the result, but I was shocked. Mm. And I felt then powerfully and I feel now powerfully that it's the wrong it was the wrong thing um, is the wrong thing for us to do um, but I suppose as a lawyer I responded by um, asking the sorts of tedious recondite questions that lawyers ask about um, whether process has been followed yes. um, what the governance of Brexit is um, what uh, doors should legitimately be locked and what doors um, really ought to be kept open, how the decision-making should be split between uh, a government, uh, then a majority, later a minority government, 
and parliament, all of these questions um, are questions that I went on to litigate. So uh, I think only three days after the referendum, I read a very compelling blog by um, some public law lawyers uh, and that blog became uh, Gina Miller's case. Uh, and uh, yes. I mean, I crowdfunded for it alongside initially before and then alongside Gina. Um, and then the Whiteman case where um, we established um, in the face of opposition from the British government, from the EU Commission and the EU Council, that the Article 50 notification could be unilaterally reversed by the United Kingdom if it wanted to. Yeah. Of course, it, we now know never did. Mm. Um, and then the prorogation case, and also litigation around whether or not the Prime Minister would be forced to send the notification that the Ben Act, so-called Ben Act mandated, uh, asking the EU for an extension. Um, he said he'd rather die in a ditch and then um, uh, sent it anyway uh, uh, and has not died in a ditch. Um, <laughs> and all of that stuff was possible, I suppose, because of having built a platform on social media yes, uh, with the tax policy work and having crossed a Rubicon so that I wasn't going any longer to be worrying about what my clients thought of the political work that I was doing. Um, and I suppose um, just being an you know, in, at heart a New Zealander who uh, doesn't know um, what he can't do. Um, too stupid to have worked that out. And so I carry on um, making the assumption that I can do things. And um, sometimes it turns out that that assumption, contrary to what my elders and betters tell me, that assumption is, is right. Um, so it's a sort of odd collection, really, of happenstance and personal pathology and, and ignorance that has caused um, Good Law Project to thrive. Your question was about politics, though. Hmm. And um, I did toy with that for a while. Um, there was a time when I was um, a sort of darling of the Labour right. Um, and I had at the time also regular relations with John McDonnell. And I remember going in to see John McDonnell, who was very keen that I throw my hat into the ring to um, be Labour's candidate in Tooting um, when Sadiq Khan became London mayor. And I thought quite seriously about that. John McDonnell was very keen on the left of the party and... Um, I knew I had the trust of the right of the party as well. Um, but in the end, I decided not to. And I, I think that was the right decision. One of the reasons why Good Law Project is prospering, flourishing, is because um, people sense that actually Parliament has become something of an empty vessel politically. Um, it has, um, you know, surprisingly for a constitution that talks about the supremacy of Parliament, very little to do, very little power. Um, and I feel as though I have much more influence and I certainly have much more freedom um, doing what I do now than I would as a, an MP, even a front bench um, shadow cabinet minister in the Labour Party. Um, you know, we have freedom at Good Law Project to say what we want to say, to follow the causes that are dear to our hearts and to pursue them in ways that are um, unflinching, really, unflinchingly honest. And I think in consequence of that, feel quite authentic to people. Yes. So um, your listeners won't know this, but um, for the first two months of this year our income annualized is not much short of um 10 million pounds so we've already become the largest 
um, legal charity or not for profit at any rate we're not a charity in the country and we're continuing to grow quite quickly um all of our funding comes from small donors um which means we don't need to be looking over our shoulder at what our um funders think um we have we have freedom and with that as i say comes a kind of authenticity of voice that i think is quite lacking in the public space at the moment yes yes it's really interesting and well done on that at least revenue one of the things i wanted to ask you and i i, I, I hope we have time to talk briefly about the abandon uh, case and uh, what the government was doing there. But um, it is the use of social media, because when I speak to students and undergrads, uh, they always ask about social media and you know, the bar standards are very clear about how the bar should be using social media and they're hot on it. And my question is, when did you become comfortable using social media? I, I note in my research that so you've got over 200,000, it's near, near to 300,000 followers, uh, only to rival, I think, the secret barrister who's been on this podcast. But when did you become comfortable using social media, not just Twitter, but, you know, blogging, um, because many of us still are not quite there yet. Maybe I speak for my, just myself, who's just posting pictures of dogs and uh, questioning uh, case law and things. <laughs> well, I think you have to have um, a pretty clear idea in your mind about why you're using social media. Um, uh, otherwise, you won't use it successfully. So initially... I thought I found Twitter an incredibly powerful place to gather intelligence about my particular practice area, which obviously was then tax. Yes. Um, and doing that on social media, I was very, very comfortable using my um, professional title. Mm. I was engaging as a barrister. And then um, when I began doing tax policy and talking about tax policy on social media, I was using Twitter not to gather intel, but to disseminate my own views of the uh, of the tax policy space. And that too was incredibly powerful. So it was through that work that I came to the attention of the Labour Party. And indeed, I met um, David Gork, who was then the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, uh, and established a very good working relationship with him when he was the uh, Tory um, FST in charge of tax policy and I believe um, uh, it's an evidence belief that I had some impact on Tory tax policy um, during the second Cameron administration um, so social media was very powerful there and it was um and this is i think is what i really love about it it was incredibly democratizing mm -hmm. i didn't need um a newspaper column i didn't need um wealth i didn't need uh celebrity um through the quality of my writing and my analysis um, I was able to reach a very, very wide audience. Um, I now use social media differently, and I'm trenchant on social media. Certainly I'm trenchant about those with power. And um, that is an activity that is um, not the activity of a a barrister it has no connection with my professional status and some time ago i decided um, that although obviously i am a qc i would no no longer use those letters on social media um and indeed that was part of the same decision making process as my decision to leave chambers i was no longer doing a barrister's work. Yeah. So I think the answer to your question is, um, you just need to know why you are using social media, what it is that you want from it. And once you've answered that question, it becomes possible for you to identify 
what the proper limits of your use of social media should be. Yes, yes. Interesting. Interesting. Um, the argue about as we record this is that, uh, of course, all the information about um, David Ca uh, Cameron and uh, his lobbying uh, uh, of uh, Greasel, and um, also uh, other things going on, we're still in um, COVID nineteen lockdown, which has been up lifted today slowly. It's the twelfth of April, but one of the things that cases that are being brought by the Good Law Project it is. Um, the deal for antibody tests done with Abingdon Health, where the government suppressed reports that raise um, uh, concerns around the effectiveness of the tests uh, and so on. It appears on paper anyway, that it ignored its own legal advice. And my question about that really is this, do we need to be holding the government to account, given we're in a pandemic, they would say they're trying to do their best to balance all um, different factors. Um, and so does the good law project need to bring these cases to challenge that and play devil's advocate I appreciate but what is the role um, therefore for the project in doing that well I think I think um, the answer is a fairly boring um, recondite lawyer's answer about process um, from good processes, from solid governance, good outcomes emerge. And without um, governance, without proper process, you're much less likely to get good outcomes. So what we know about Abingdon, taking that as uh, the example you gave, is that we spent many tens of millions of pounds on buying antibody tests from a company with links to the government's own scientific advisor. We spent that money, despite the fact that the company hadn't got any antibody tests and there were others who had them. Um, we know that government suppressed evidence showing that those tests were not going to work. We know that the contracts were entered into in the face of internal legal advice given to government and indeed uh, advice later confirmed by government's external legal advisors that was reported by um, the mail. Um, and we know that the tests don't work <laughs> and that government has stopped commissioning from Abingdon. And I think that story tells you why governance is important. This is not private money that we're spending. This is public money that we're spending. And it's important um, because it's public money that it be spent um, in pursuit of the public interest rather than, as in some of these cases, um, I believe at any rate in pursuit of private interests. Yes, yeah, well, very well put. Um, actually. Um, Joe, can I ask you, um, sort of move on a bit and ask you about well-being? I'm quite passionate about trying to avoid burnout and having been silk for all these years, um, I, which will involve long hours, um, hard work, many weekends gone um, and so on. I, I wondered now you're in a slightly different uh, sphere, um, how you maintain to have some semblance of wellness and well-being. Um, whilst being a QC and, and now what what you do you know I don't know if you read or you're a mammal you know out on the bike cycling in Lycra uh, at all um, uh, my, my research hasn't shown that but I just wonder how you're keeping um, kind of you know well uh, both mentally and physically uh, I'm very pleased Sally to hear that your researchers have uncovered precisely zero photos of me in, in Lycra um, they would not be <laughs> a good sight, I think it's fair to say. Um, I, um, I mean, for me, my mental health is, I mean, it's really important. It's, um, I guess, the most difficult thing I do um, uh, and the most important because unless I do that well, I can't do anything else. And for me, um, 
I guess I draw my mental health from my family. I have a, uh, an extremely good and loving marriage. I have three kids who um, support the work that I do um, and are interested in it and engaged by it. I mean, they're young. My yeah. youngest just turned 10 yesterday and my oldest is only 14. But they're politically engaged and they're interested and, and you know, they like what I do. Um, so I think, um, I think it comes from them. Um, and it also comes from a sense um, that you have when you become older of allowing things to be as good as they need to be um, rather than always perfect. And that's the message that I try to give to my kids, actually. Um, I say to them, look, you know, at school, you're always going to be told you must work hard at everything all of the time. And that's rubbish, I say to them. Work out the things that are important to you. Um, work hard at them. Um, ignore the other stuff. Just do the bare minimum. Um, accept that there will be times in your school career when you'll need to work incredibly hard um, and allow yourself at other moments to, to cruise through and be happy and, and balanced. And um, I mean, that's a rather odd message to give to your kids, but by telling them that you're content for them to cruise on some occasions, you win the right to be heard by them when you tell them um, in respect of other occasions that they have to work incredibly hard. And I mean, that, that at least is how I manage my, my, my life. It, it, it's, it's by working out um, what I really, really do need to work hard at and, and, and what I can um, just go a little more lightly on. Yes, I was taking a note actually because it seems to me quite good life lessons for the bar uh, and the vast amount of people who listen to this podcast, not at the bar or, or in the profession as solicitors or otherwise. Well, finally, Joe, I know you've got to go, but I wonder if I can ask you what advice would you give perhaps the younger you or just young people who are aspiring to coming to our profession as solicitors or barristers or um, you know, clerks, uh, they're called paralegals now, aren't they? Um, or case workers, silex, so on and so forth. Because COVID has created difficulties all round, but specifically for young people um, who are trying to you know, get in, who don't have connections and all the usual awful things. Um, uh, what, what advice or tips would you have um, to, to, to give them? Um, to those who are studying law, I think I would say that becoming a good lawyer is a, it's a sort of process of a kind of enculturalization. You have to um, become a lawyer um, in your head. You have to learn to think like a lawyer thinks. Um, and that is a, 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 a process of acquiring a culture of enculturalization, as I put it. Um, and the best way to do that actually is not by reading textbooks, it's by reading case law, um, because then you are steeped in how and where and why the law is made. So um, try and make time um, every day to read one or two cases and don't read them for the ratio um, read them from the first words to the last and try and understand everything that is happening in that report that will mean that you acquire less legal knowledge because you won't be reading the eight ratios that you might have read had you done a different exercise but it will 
mean that you become um, a better lawyer. You'll acquire the skills um, that enable lawyers to succeed. And to those who are already lawyers, yes. um, my advice, I think, would be to remember what you want, not to be trapped by other people's notions of success. Um, I mean, I am contacted from time to time by um, young lawyers, by those who've been offered um, training contracts at, you know, magic circle firms or, you know, barristers who are young and in successful practice. And, 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 and they say, you know, I, I'm not sure whether I should go through with this. The world is sort of falling down around my ears and this doesn't seem to me to be an activity that has much social value. Shall I throw it all in and, you know, will it be a job for me or a project? And I always say, actually, no, um, do your training, um, take the benefits of what you acquire in your early years of practice yes. the trick is not to um, allow your expenditure to increase as your income does because then you become trapped um, by the need to earn a very substantial income uh, trapped into pursuing a life that the younger you would not have wanted and the mature you probably doesn't really want either. Um, living with less money is surprisingly easy. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I mean, as a tax silk, um, you're extremely, I was gonna say well paid, I mean overpaid really. Um, fortunate. Director of the Law Project, you earn the salary of a backbench MP, which is about 80 grand. Um, but I don't find that um, having less money has a material impact on my personal happiness or sense of satisfaction and engagement with the world. Mm. Don't be trapped by your income. Yes, yes. I suppose it's a bit different, though, if people want to go, for example, into publicly funded work, which I do, have done for, what, 20 odd years. But the debt that they accrue now before they even start makes it difficult, doesn't it? Um, so I suppose it's a, it's a balancing exercise. C can I ask you if you're a keen reader? Women in the Law, we have a book club, a monthly book club, where we uh, invite um, the author. And so uh, Gina Miller actually was our author of uh, March last month, because we read her book, Rise. Uh, and uh, they, they have to have a legal link, but I wondered if you have a, a favorite book, it doesn't have to be law related, uh, and uh, maybe a favorite fictional lawyer um, that you could share with us. Um, even if it's Atticus Finch, I'll let you off, uh, because a, a, a lot of us say that. Um, but um, I, I wonder if you're, if you're a keen reader and what, what your favorite book might be. Uh, and uh, yeah, a fictional lawyer. And don't do what uh, Lady Hale did, which is to say uh, that she tends to just like the books she's reading. It depends on what she's reading at the, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I did push her and I can't remember what else she said then actually. But uh, yeah, I wonder if you're a keen reader. It, it looks like you are, certainly, you know, to be in tax. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, what's your favorite book? Um, I think the book, that gives me most ongoing pleasure and that I come back to is probably um, Earthly Powers, um, Anthony Burgess's um, masterpiece. Oh. Um, all of human life, um, all of its horror and its mystery um, is in that book. But I don't um, read as much as I used to. I um, I guess I um, don't really have the time. I mean, I did an MA in modern 
literature as an escape from legal practice yes. about five or six years into my um, practice as a tax lawyer. I have loved reading. I have loved Beckett in the past. Yes. Um, funnily enough, legal inspirations in, in fiction, it probably is Tom Cruise and A Few Good Men. That scene at the beginning where he's in the baseball cage and he's yeah. hitting the, the balls um, uh, and he works out that they've come to him because uh, they desperately want um, the case to settle and he dawn and it dawns on him um, that that means something quite important about the case that he has um, is a lesson actually that that resonates for me I um, am often in a position where the easy thing for good or project to do is to settle a case and I have to remember that it's not actually about getting a, a, a win, in inverted commas. It's about changing things. Yes. And, and I, 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 I do draw inspiration from the, um, that batting cage um, at the start of A Few Good Men. <laughs> I, I love that because most people actually tend to think of the courtroom scene with um, uh, Jack Nicholson, don't they? You That's know? right. You want the truth, you can't handle the truth. I mean, I like that bit as well, to be honest. But, <laughs> but <laughs> no, no, it's, it's the earlier bit actually that I find um, that, 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 that does contain a, a, a lesson for me anyway. Yes, no, and I think it's, it's, it's spot on. It's a bit like employment cases that I do that I call them point of principle cases. It's often not about the um, remedy actually for the individuals. It's about the process and bringing that case in, into public knowledge. Um, Joe, that has been wonderful. Um, if could I squeeze in one last question before you go? Um, and the question's about diversity um, in our profession which um, I, I'm always very keen to for us to try and improve. And that's kind of what this podcast is about, really. Um, you know, wh what do you think about diversity? How can we do better? You know, we often, uh, Joanna Hardy, who I'm sure you know, when she came on here, and she's a friend, was saying, you know, sometimes people think that it's all okay at the bar now because we talk about it so much and because we've got social mobility ambassadors, because you see women or, you know, women like me, I didn't see a black female barrister, I don't think, because I was about 22, 25. Um, and so things are better and they look better, but what, what do you think about diversity in the legal profession, um, both with our you know, brother and sister colleagues, the solicitors, um, and, and how can we do better, do you think? Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we, we need to do a lot better. Um, I mean, I sat on the Quality and Diversity Committee of the Bar Council for um, five or six years. Yes, I, I saw that. And subcommittee looking at the retention of women yes. at the bar. I was um, writing about, uh, I was blogging about how few, um, to use the nomenclature of um, the... Uh, it's on the judiciary.gov website, I think. Uh, there were only four full-time black British judges in the whole of England and Wales. You know, just a, just a shockingly poor number. Um, and um, I, I'm not persuaded that things are meaningfully improving, actually. I would align with um, those like Sadiq Khan who have called for um, positive discrimination. Um, and I would align with um, those like Sadiq Khan because I recognize that the law is a human instrument um, to which judges bring their own preconceptions of um, ethics of right and wrong and that if our judiciary comes from a narrow 
social strata or a narrow realm of human experience, um, you know, be it um, uh, ethnicity or gender or ability or sexuality, whatever it is, um, the effect is to is 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 a very conservative one um the effect of creating law in the mold of a very narrow section of society is to have a law that reflects the value judgments of that very narrow selection of society and that very narrow section of society's value judgments are often wrong um, and that really, really matters. I mean, I've done a lot of work in the last couple of years around um, trans rights. Yes. And that made me very, very aware of that which um, I imagine most, um, you know, black men and women in the country knew <laughs> before I um, always slow um, worked it out, which is that there is a vast amount of um, injustice <laughs> everywhere. And that injustice is perpetuated by an overwhelmingly white, privileged, um, upper middle class judiciary. And so I think diversity matters um, for me in particular for that reason. Yes. Without diversity, the law is illegitimate. Wow. Gosh, I think that might be my, my quote to, uh, to accompany this podcast uh, uh, when it goes out. Um, the final thing is, I absolutely love New Zealand. Uh, and uh, when I was there, I spent a lot of time doing bungee jumps, but that's another story. Uh, and, uh, and enjoying the country and the, and the culture. And I wondered if you ever went back at all. You know, I know we can't presently, uh, <clears throat> but whether you ever holiday there at all. Yeah, or... I, I went back all the time when my kids were younger. Uh, when my grandfather was still alive, he died December 2019. He was 100 and almost 101. Wow. Um, we haven't been back since the pandemic. And I, you know, my mum and father still live there and I miss them and New Zealand very much. Um, yeah, it, it, it has been, it has been, it has been difficult not, not, not being able to go back. No, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Joe, thank you for spending um, quite a long time with me. Um, what's next for the Good Law Project? Can you talk about any cases uh, that are coming or which we might? Well, we have a whole run of procurement litigation in the next um, couple of months. Uh, we're awaiting decisions on public first. We've got a sort of six day trial on our PP procurement cases. Uh, and there is an awful lot more in the frame. Um, we're bringing litigation to challenge the um, uh, so-called misnamed levelling up fund, uh, spending on um, political advertising of public funds. Um, there is um, uh, much uh, to do, I'm afraid. Yes. <laughs> I wish there was less. Yes, well, we'll we will watch um, this space, and I hope you'll perhaps come back to talk to me, actually, about some of these um, in uh, slightly happier times post pandemic. Um, thank you so much, Jolien Mornham. Thanks, Sally. That was a lot of fun.